The only real hope and change you'll ever get is from God. It's going to come from the Lord or it's not going to come at all. It's going to come when you admit that you can't do it and that you've got to have His help. People are looking for the Nephilim to return. Now, nowhere in the Bible does it say they're going to return in the last days. Not, not one place in the Bible. The book of Enoch is different. The book of Jasher is different. You can't find that anywhere else. And it's very difficult to trust all these other narratives out there, right? He don't read that. So, But a lot of people are looking for them to return. And we also read in the book of Daniel, they would mingle themselves with the seed of men, but they would not cleave one to another, which means they would not take unto themselves wives. But it means they're active with humanity. That's what it means. Now you're talking about angels who are going to mingle the seed of men with themselves. You're not talking about the Nephilim, you're talking about angels. The same angels who are right here on this earth. Something else people missed. In the Bible, this is not addressed enough and therefore I address it a lot. Now I know I'm skipping some places here, but I have to read it. If you guys would turn to Revelation 12, please. Now we're going to go over this again with a different uh, point. Revelation 12, when it read, most people, they instantly go to the heavens. That's what they do. I want you guys to keep something in mind. Before anything was, there was the Word. Before the stars, before constellations, before the earth, before the sun, before anything, there was the Word. The Word came first. Creation is made, and it tells the story of the Word. God the Creator had a Word, and He gave that Word. And when He gave that Word, He spoke into existence what we know. The stars, the heavens, constellations, all those things. But the Word was first. I've noticed something about the Father from the Old Testament to this very day. He's very consistent in how he makes things. To understand the internal workings of the human body is to understand celestial mechanics. If you understand celestial mechanics, you'll understand the workings of the human body. Components of the body closely mirror that of those things in space. Those things in space represent the smallest atom. The strong nuclear force discovered and all these different quarks and tiny little particles and forces that they uncovered at CERN. The same forces exist on a larger scale everywhere else. Symmetry, all that stuff. It's not some new idea. In fact, about 4,000 years ago, there were some documents that were extracted. And of course, they're in the uh, Indian text also. Mathematics is in there. Calculus is in there. Trigonometry is in there. All these different mathematical disciplines are found in those books. So when they attribute the discovery of the atom to individuals, they didn't discover anything. They rediscovered what already was known about. In grave detail, they won't tell the truth about the Egyptians. They would rather people think that the Egyptians were ETs than to really start to uncover the scientific exploits of Egypt. Egypt was involved in some stuff, but you would find that they were quite familiar to those of society today. They're magicians, essentially scientists. That's what they were. They were in communication with a very special set of Egyptians. They could not fit in Egypt. That's right, I said it. They could not fit in Egypt. But their science is... They found medical tools. They discovered these guys were doing brain surgery. They dealt with cancer. They knew about marijuana, cocaine, LSD, all these things they knew about. So essentially, we have been rediscovering things. That's all. And isn't it funny how one person can have an idea? Do you not know that 1,500 other people have the exact same idea at the exact same time? It's kind of like that uh, test they did with monkeys on one island. They were teaching these monkeys... I believe they taught them how to wash a, a sweet potato in the ocean. They were doing it a different way, but they, were, they taught them how to wash sweet potatoes on an island separate from all the other monkeys. You're talking about miles away. You know what happened after they got 100 monkeys to wash off their sweet potatoes? All the monkeys on the other islands instantly began to do it. Do you know that? So once you reach a certain level of learning with a certain number of species, the rest of the species automatically have it. Why is that? Well, it's the same reason. You know when somebody's looking at you. You're walking in a store and all of a sudden you turn around and look somebody dead in the eye. The same person you look dead in the eye just so happens to be looking at you. Now, how did you do that? How did you turn and look directly at the person? Out of all the people, you turn and look at the one who's looking at you. How did you do that? That's not magic. That's because people don't really understand. The base glue of all things. You ready? You know what it is, you just probably don't know what it is. You ready? It's called sound. Everything is sound. You know radio waves, they lie about radio waves. Did you know that? 
they do. They lie about radio waves. Propagation, all that stuff they figured out, they lied about it because they're using all the mathematics that are constant with sound. And I happen to be one of those who still works with transistors. But there's something interesting about sound. You ready? Sound creates something called a pattern. When a pattern reaches, I'm going to call it a maximum state. Here's what that means. When sound reaches a certain level, a certain set of octaves create something called a pattern. When it reaches its maximum state, it cannot be interfered with by other frequencies. No matter what frequency you introduce, it will not change. Planets do that. Your body does that. In fact, your body exists solely from what the planets are producing. You know what that means? If you try to go way out there past the planets, you're not going to make it too far. Because your body is held together. And the instructions for the body are in those patterns of sound given off by the planets. That means if one planet is destroyed, it's going to change all life on this planet. Do you guys know that? All it takes is the destruction of one planet. Now, that happened twice in our past. I know people know about one, which is quite amazing to me. It is. I wasn't well-versed on what everybody was writing out there for many years. I believe it was uh, 2008. I began to be informed about what civilians were doing. That's when I learned that many of you guys knew about one specific planet. But that was just one of, few, of, of, of a couple. Now, the story behind it, I do not subscribe to. But we had two destroyed planets that left some clear trails. How did they know that? Because they went and got samples of the stuff. That's why. They know how that looks. They will not give civilians the actual pictures they took. They will not give a civilian the actual pictures they took. And if you if you know this, there, there was some some a uh, little bit of stink started to come up with NASA about their sanitizing of images. They sanitized images of the moon. They sanitized images of everything except Russia did not sanitize images of Venus. So that's when they found out that they were not telling the truth about the planets. And it's of no consequence. It really isn't. Because none of us would ever want to go to any of those places. No more than you would like to live in the center of the earth, would you? How many of you would like to live at the bottom of the sea in the water with everything that's down there? I would not. Thank God I'm on land. I'm made for land, not, not that stuff. So you probably would not want to live anywhere else. God made a perfectly sustained place that we do occupy. So, but they lied about them. Why did they lie about them? Mankind has an issue, and it began with King Nebuchadnezzar. King Nebuchadnezzar erected an empire. It was run by policy. It had inclusive with it all elements required for human consumption, even a faith from time to time. Rome took it one step further. They had an outlet called the games. They still had all the other common elements. War is something necessary so that people can live. Right? That's why you guys, whether you admit it or not, you have to see certain things at least once every two weeks where you become emotionally unstable. That's a consequence of your flesh. But they didn't tell the truth. Now, you don't know the truth about the planets. You have no interest in going there, right? You don't worry about the history or anything else. And if you're not worried about the history and it's dead and that's what they taught you, you would never notice any connection to those other planets and the one you're on right now. You'd never notice. You would come up with every idea you could, but it would not be inclusive of those other planets. And when that took place, you can never know the whole story. And if that took place, it's going to be very difficult to believe books like Enoch. Once that takes place, you can be guided. And the level of your belief will always be under control. Controlled by the same people who have mastered the art of dominating kingdoms. Then you have these stories that come out, right? Somebody within them has something called discernment. Discernment will automatically show you when you're young that you're not seeing the whole truth. When you're a kid, you knew you were not seeing the whole truth. You knew there was more to it than what you saw. You knew that people, somebody was hiding the heart of what you needed to see. Somebody was hiding that, but they taught you that somehow your God doesn't like it when you go out looking for extra things. Somebody taught you that. That's not what your father said. And when somebody taught you that, you found yourself complacent with following the dictates of man as they seemed to follow God. And people became complacent. And they supported that. And they forced other people to do it too. That's why, in the in, listen, in the body of Christ right now, you hear something opposite of what Jesus taught. Jesus taught liberty, not force. But what do you hear in the body of Christ? You hear people saying, well, what you have to do is this. And you need to do this. That's control. 
well, that person needs to do this and needs Jesus. To, he never spoke like that. He never spoke like that. He never worked like that. He never placed anything upon anybody by force. He would always ask. And if they said no, he would never go any further. Some people he did not approach because of their lack of faith. Remember, he was at his own hometown. They said, well, isn't this Jesus that so-and-so would to say? He did no other miracles because of their faith. And so where people don't want it, Jesus did not operate. Isn't that something? He didn't force anything. But something has crept into the body of Christ and made it like a wrestling match, like a football game. It's very competitive. It is. Pep rallies are included. They snap their fingers and people have the spirit. They snap them again and the spirit goes away. No, sorry, it didn't work that way. That's not even, that can't, that, well, I'll stand by, that's not real. God directs his own spirit. Man cannot dare direct the spirit of the living God. They forget that. That's phony. I can't talk about that. Because that is almost heartbreaking. That drudges up a lot of things because of man's arrogance. Anyway, they have people doing this and then their lives become ineffective. The word they carry becomes ineffective. Now, that should be an outrage. A person should be outraged. That they're ineffective. That they have to deal with things. That let me tell you something. No demon can ever go and occupy a person who is filled with Christ or the Holy Spirit. That's impossible. So what is the problem? I'll tell you the problem. Selective reading and selective listening and the lies planted people have come up with their own narrative. They have taught you to stay within the confines of their edicts. And if you dare go outside, you're going to be excommunicated. How do we know this? Because if somebody like me were to speak openly to a lot of people, I would be excommunicated. Do you know that? It's a natural component within people taught to them. They're not realizing that if somebody does not stay within the confines of the faith you were instructed to keep, you are also instructed to excommunicate that person. Same thing they did to Christ when Christ came to the earth. They killed him. They didn't want to hear a word he had to say. They wanted him to die. But why? He told us why. He said, because men love darkness rather than light. So in truth, they did not like the light. They loved darkness. Well, what darkness did they love? I didn't notice any dark things among the Pharisees. Did you guys? Not dark as you would. They weren't worshiping witches or anything. But they were dark in this degree. You ready? They loved their own rule. They made their own path. And they would not suffer anybody to change what they had labored to build. Do you hear me? They built that up. That was passed down from person to person to person to person. They safeguarded it. They loved it. They were patriotic behind it. They defended that. And in so doing, God called them a brood of vipers. Because they were not spreading God's truth. They were spreading their own truth. They weren't spreading God's kingdom and rule. They were spreading their own kingdom and rule. And when Jesus came and said, well, you don't have to go through them anymore. You can go directly to the living God through me. They said, oh. How dare he? They were worried about power. All those people that got healed. And you know what they said? They acknowledged the healings and they said, we have to kill him. Or they're going to follow him and not us. Now, he healed people. But they were primarily worried about losing people to him. That's all they cared about. Their power. That's why I will never listen to a person who would ever tell me, don't listen to that guy. Don't listen to that guy. If I hear somebody say that, I will not hear another word they have to say. That's that human rule nonsense. That's almost sickening to hear somebody say that. Well, they point at someone and say, don't listen to a word they have to say. It's the same thing the Pharisees did. And if you're saying, well, you shouldn't be like that. Jesus wasn't like that. Well, I'm not Jesus. I'm not him. I'm trying to walk like him, but I'm not Christ. I'm just like you. But let's face it. We have slipped. And most of the world is back to square one. On occasion, you find ministers who are rare and precious. So, having said all that, people read Revelation 12 and they miss the entire point. What did you naturally think of Revelation 12? Somebody said Revelation 12 reminds me of astrology. A lot of people move into that realm and they start looking for a sign, is my point. When I first read this, it's almost like everybody started to talk about a sign. That's what they talked about. But when I read it, I gave no sign, which made everybody mad. And I told everybody it was a history. It was a summary of its right. That's all it was. Just a simple summer. And there appeared a great wonder in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun and the moon at her feet. And upon her head, a crown of 12 stars. Why would 12 stars be there? The 12 tribes. Each tribe has a star. Did you know that? Each one. Creation was made by the word. The same word we read governed how creation looks. Everything God made important. 
you're going to find in creation, period. She being what child cried, travailing in birth and pain to be delivered. And there appeared another wonder in heaven, and behold, a great red dragon having seven heads and ten horns and seven crowns upon his heads. These are real astrological signs, appearances, events, and tables, charts, and calendars. But the heavens will tell you of the word of God. And his tail drew a third part of the stars, this dragon is Satan. And the word dragon is used because it represents a system, not just Lucifer. Not just him, but Lucifer's plan too, and Lucifer's rule. The dragon is never absent his rule. Whenever you see that word dragon, you're looking at the entirety of a system. The rule of that system, which includes the, you know, the subjects and the, all these old things and the plans of that thing. So the dragon is inclusive of all those things. And we continue to remember that. Remember that. And, the, and, and it says he drew a third part of the stars of heaven. Well, we know what the stars of heaven are. That word star is the same word that matches son of God. Or messenger, messenger, right? So stars, messenger, or son of God, are one of the same in a lot of places in the Bible, just in case you did not know that. So when you see the word stars, in a lot of cases it means sons of God. When you see sons of God, a lot of cases it means stars. So when stars fall to earth, it demands, it demands your attention to find out which one it's talking about. Because in the original text, it did not use that word. See, they were very specific in the Greek. They did not have one word that represented 20 million things. They did not. And the original text was longer than this. Like, for example, where it says, And there appeared a great wonder in heaven and a woman, a, a woman clothed with the sun and the moon under her feet and upon her head a crown of 12 stars. Do you not know that that was half a page of text? Now, they shrunk that half a page of text down into this one line thing. When I first came across Kano Greek, right, which is the original language, that, that base root Greek from which all of the Greek is utilized. When I first encountered that, and then they had the people there that could actually decipher all of the Grecian uh, dialect, right? I was shocked. I said, well, what in the world? How can people extract the truth? And then it hit me, the Holy Spirit. You, there's no way somebody can extract the truth from the Word of God without the Holy Spirit. There's no way. You cannot do that logically. You can't because only the Holy Spirit can reveal to you that underlying fullness of it. You cannot go to a dictionary and think that you're going to uh, repeat exactly what it says. Nope. If you're not giving it spiritually, you don't have it. And yet you see a lot of people, they learn the word of God by a dictionary and they're devoid spiritually. Not one saint is to walk this earth depressed. Do you hear me? Depression is not of your father. So how can Christ dwell in a person who is depressed? And I was depressed at one point. Now, you can know of the Lord. But his indwelling is not in a person who is consistently depressed. That's not our place, no matter what happens in your life. But see, all we have to do is recognize that's a spirit that is not of our Father. It is quite intrusive, quite intrusive. And it will cause you to interpret the Bible in a very specific way. It will cause you to read it with the spirit of error. And when you take in things, it's going to be highly defensive. Why is this not discussed? Because God outlined this in the Old Testament. Jesus talked about it in the New Testament, yet we don't cover it. Somebody say, claim your joy. Well, it, it, with all respect, no, don't claim your joy. You don't have to. That's, that's almost like claiming Christ. If you accept Christ, Christ is real. When he comes in, there's going to be a physical and spiritual change. You never have to fake joy. Never. Joy is real. Don't fake it. If you don't have it, you don't have it. Then go get it. If you don't have something, that's just like a person starving. They're walking outside of a restaurant. Somebody comes out and says, hey, you want something to eat? Oh, no, I'm good and full. I'm claiming I'm full. You can see their elbow. And their elbows look like snow cones. Or something is wrong. They're hungry. You don't claim You don't claim that. You say, look, I'm hungry. And I can assure you, after that person eats, they're going to have a smile on their face. And they're going to say, yes, I'm full. Never fake it like you have joy. Go get the real thing. And don't claim stuff you don't have. Go get it. You don't have to claim something. You go and get it. Get the real thing. Don't live your life by a claim. Go and get it. I know people are not going to like that statement, but don't do that. Go get the real thing and don't be satisfied until you have the real thing. Don't settle for not having it and then smiling in somebody's face like you do have it. You do a great disservice to yourself when you do that. Go and get it. Align yourself with the Lord. Let him go to work with you. 
Let him demonstrate to you. Let him show you. Let him feel you. Get the real thing. There are too many people who have the fake thing. You know what the Bible says? The Bible says a man who cannot bridle his own tongue, that man's religion is vain. Don't follow that guy. If a person cannot bridle their tongue, that person's belief is vain. Do not follow that guy or that gal. Do you hear me? That's what the word says. That means if I lost my temper and started cursing, saying all bad things, put people down into the ground, you guys better not listen to another word I say. Anybody who cannot bridle their tongue, that person's religion is vain. I said that one time, and obviously somebody didn't know it was in the Word of God, and they said, well, no man can tame the tongue. I said, we're not talking about taming the tongue. And that was in the Old Testament. We're talking about the New Testament. Jesus has finished the work, and everything is possible now. There is no impossibility. All those things people think were impossible, that was Old Testament. That was prior to Christ. Christ has come, he died, and he was raised again. And so are we. Everything is put back in place. So then go get in place. You don't have to claim you're with Christ. Go be with him. I can't do the claim thing. I'm not faking it. If I'm not going to fake joy. I'm not going to fake anything. If I don't have it, I don't have it. I told you I'm like that kid at Christmas. Give me the best toy in the world with no batteries. I'm going to look at you and say, what is this? Well, that's that great toy you want. It has no batteries. It does me no good. What good is a toy with no batteries? I'm that kid at Christmas. I'm not going to smile and be happy because it's, it's not doing anything. It was better off still in a box, wrapped up, not unopened. With the Lord, he did what he did for real. So you can have things for real. Not so you can claim it and hope it comes 90 years later. No, he did what he did so that you can have it right now. How do you find out what's yours? You have to go talk to him. Go find out for real. Don't listen to a thousand people. Go and listen to Christ. That's the missing element. You and him, one-on-one. -on -one. You reading about him, walking with him as you read. Then asking him directly as you read, Lord, is this, did you say this? That's a relationship. A relationship is not you listening to me all the time. You never open your Bible and you ask the Lord those things that I'm talking about. That's not a relationship. I'm I. He's the only one that can wake you up. Some of you accepted him, but you're still laying in the dirt. You're breathing again, but you're in the dirt. It's time for you to be raised. You're going to be cleaned up and raised. Nobody on earth can do that for you. Only your Messiah can do that. You come out the grave, your eyes are open, you're breathing, but you're still halfway in the dirt. You're not standing on your feet. You have life, but you have not been raised. Only he can show you that. You're not going to get that from people. You can forget it. You want the easy way to get that? And you think it's been people? You wasted 40 years of your life trying to get that from people, and you still don't have it. Time to try it the Lord's way. Every other way has failed, and we know it. So go and find Christ right from the very beginning. I believe it's called Matthew. There you go. Start reading. I'm telling you. You read that and follow your Lord through that book. No matter what, you will follow him. And when he turns and you finally see him, some of you for the first time, because you actually pursued him, you actually heard him, you may not have understood it, but when he looks at you, he is the one that will open your mind. You know what happens with the King James Version? A lot of people get frustrated with it like I did. I said, wait a minute, Lord, I'm not going to another Bible. I'm going to stick with that one. Because when I first read the King James, the these and the thous and the thuses, okay, that's confusing. But I told the Lord I wouldn't go into another. I want that one because it's the closest one for me to the truth. You know, I had my legit reasons. They were legit for me. My reasons may not be your reason, but they were legit. And do you know what happened one day? Honestly, it sounded different. One night, I was yawning and everything. It was like everything was fighting it. My brain was fogging up. All sorts of things were happening. I wouldn't let it. I, per I persisted. Now, I remember going outside and I said, Lord, I want to know your word from me, not from somebody else. I don't want it from anybody else. I want it from you. And I persisted. And I wasn't understanding anything. And he knew it. And I kept reading. I'm just telling you. I'm telling you. I just kept going. I got tired and forced my way through it. And said, I got finished an entire book in the Bible. Then I went back the next day and did the same thing. The same thing again. Still didn't understand it, but I did it. And I got through that whole book again. And the Lord knew I was going to do it. And I was going to keep doing that until he would open up my ears and eyes where I could actually see it. I'm telling you what, on that, the third time I got into it, the same thing started. The yawn came and then it left. I said, hmm, that was weird. Because every time I would start reading, I would begin to yawn out of control. Kind of like making a young kid pray over the food for the first time. 
Right? They start doing that and they start yawning. That's your flesh fighting the Word of God. It, it wants nothing to do with the Word of God. So young people, if you make them read a scripture, they're, they're going to start yawning. I yawned and it went away. Then I was reading and there was a part of it that was just so confusing. And all of a sudden it started to clear up. Then I began to read out loud, right? And I was, as I was reading out loud, I was forcing it through there. All that fogginess went away. When I got halfway through, I could understand what I was reading. I understood so much, I went back and I said, wait a minute, didn't that match here? And I caught myself. I said, wolf, I'm actually reading this with full comprehension. It doesn't sound weird and strange. And there's something else. How can you have an understanding of words that you, you've not been acquainted with? Certain phrases that you've not been acquainted with. The Lord did that, not me. The Lord did. I'm telling you this because the Lord did this. Now, that didn't happen in college. No, that happened through persistence. Because nothing was going to deter me from following Christ. And it opened up. I mean, it opened up. I used to give people that advice. And I would get tickled. Because I would say, how many times have you tried to read that whole chapter? If they honestly did it, I'm telling you, every time on the third time, it opened up to them. Don't ask me. But on the third time, it opened up to them. And they would get so excited. In fact, there was one guy scared him to death. I mean, it scared, he stuttered. This guy stuttered, and it scared him to death. I mean, to death, it scared him to death. He was scared and happy at the same time because he had never experienced anything like that. But see, he wanted to know who Christ was. And they listened to my reasoning for sticking with the King James Version. And then the King James Version opened up to them where it was no longer a barrier. The Lord did that. Nobody else did that. The Lord did that. That came from the Lord. That did not come from any other place. That came from the Lord. That is unexplainable. That just doesn't happen. But I'm telling you right now, when you pursue Christ, it's going to be tried at first to see if you want to pursue him. They pursued him, remember, and they got hungry, but they still followed him. They didn't eat anything all day, and they were outside away from their homes, but yet they still listened. And what happened? As they continued to follow him, they were all fed, weren't they? You'll notice that if you persist, that is your truth. See, when, when you tell a lie, you say, well, I'm going to go here and do so-and-so. And if you give up the first five minutes, it wasn't in your heart. So you just tried something. You never did anything. When you go after something and everything gets in your way and you're still pursuing it, now you're doing it. And when you start doing it because you pursued it, it's going to open up to you. But everything will be tried. When you go after anything, it's going to be, you're going to have a trial connected to see if you really want that and what it does is it demonstrates to you and it opens up to you the truth because you can go after things that you really don't want and as soon as the opposition comes you'll say nope this isn't for me let me go back home thank you lord for that but if you really desire something it does not matter what comes you're going to pursue it the lord does that not so he can see it's so that we can see you would never know what you have a true heart for if you did not face opposition do you guys see that? You have to face opposition in a family. When you face opposition, when it gets tough, if you persist and you're faithful, that hardship becomes glue. All of you people who wore a uniform. Now, we all know, all of us who wore a uniform, we all know there is no other bond you'll ever have closer than those you almost died with. It creates a lifelong unbreakable bond that nobody can ever know unless they go through that same crucible. You have to go through a crucible with somebody else to have that type of bond. And it never breaks no matter what. That bond is formed and it never breaks. Never will it break. Why? Because listen, when you can face obstacles and trials and everything else, but you're still pursuing something, that demonstrates and it also defines you actually want that of your soul. Of your soul. Do you see that? See, some things you want by the eye. And when a trial comes, and you say, nope, I don't want that. Then the truth was you really did not want that. When you want something of your soul and something comes, if you really do want it and it's true and it's of your soul, it does not matter what comes. You're going to weather every single storm. You're going to do what you have to do, but you will always pursue it. That's the only way you can know what you really want, what you don't want. Did you hear me? That's how we know. We don't know unless it is tried like that. And so what I'm telling you is this. You may say you like a lot of things. You may say you want a lot of things. The only one that really knows is your father. And what he does is he provides a trial, an obstacle. He provides that to get in our way. If we persist to go after it, then of the soul we really did want it. But if we give up on it, then in truth we did not want it. We wanted it, 
by the eye, but nothing was behind it. Do you see that? That's our Father showing us what we really wanted and what we really did not want. A lot of people look at that as some sort of mistake they're making in life. No, it isn't. That's God showing us the truth of ourselves. He shows us the truth of ourselves. When a soldier goes through something with another soldier, in those moments of trial, that's when they find out that, yes, I'll die for them. I mean, they find that out and they walk after. See, in the beginning, and I'm telling you right now, in the beginning, you think you would do that for everybody. When you're put in one of those pick and choose situations, you really find out what you're made of and what you'll do. You don't know until you face that. I've seen people fold up. I've seen some people just go, they become the smallest folks become David and the biggest folks fold up like a lawn chair. But in either case, you find out. Your pursuance of Christ is going to be tried. If you want it easy, then how did you really want it? If you really want to follow Christ like this automatic thing, then I'll tell you something. If you obtain anything in life that you did not labor for, you ready? You're not going to have the highest appreciation for it. You're not. When you labor for something and you don't get it, and that same thing you hurt yourself over and you still don't get it, and that same thing you continue to labor and hurt yourself for it, and all of a sudden you get it, after pouring in all of yourself into it, guess what's going to happen? When you get it in your hand, no harm will ever come to it. You will not disregard it. Why? Because you paid a price for it. That's why. If you get something you did not pay a price for, it could collect dust somewhere. You pay a high price for something. Oh, believe me. Oh, believe me. You're not going to suffer anything to happen to it. And guess what? Didn't your Father in Heaven pay a high price for you? I think He did. It cost the life of His Word. He could have redeemed us a very simple way. But it redeemed us through the death of his word. You know what God's word is? God's word is him. It's everything that represents him. And he had that word made flesh and put to death. My goodness. That means he gave the most precious thing to redeem us. That's the highest price he could pay. Do you hear me? He paid the highest price he could pay for you. Stop thinking about everybody else. Start thinking about you. He paid that price for you. Do you really think he's going to lose you? Do you really think he would sacrifice Christ for nothing? He paid the highest price for you. When you pursue something and you pay the highest price for it, you're going to cherish it. When you pursue Christ, if God did not have obstacles in the way, you wouldn't pay anything for it. You would not value your relationship. So I'm telling you right now, you're going to run right into a brick wall in your pursuance of Christ. But if you really want it, you'll persevere and you will have it. You will have it. Do you understand? And it will be a valued relationship, not just some weird thing you read. Nope, it's going to become real. And part of that reality is your Father's response through Christ. For the first time, many of you will actually have your encounters. You'll actually have the promises manifest. Let's go ahead and face it. Many of you right now, your perception of what it cost you to get there, you don't have a perception of it didn't cost you anything. All you have to do, you need to go back and see the truth of your life and pursue your Lord with all truth. Not for a side reason. Pursue him with all truth. Honor him with all truth. You'll find out. And it's all going to be based up on your pursuance of him. Never precede him. He never said that. He just said, come follow me. To follow him is to have a desire to be like him. He said, greater things will you do than these. Remember that? So what's everybody doing? What are you doing? I'll tell you what you're doing. Somebody convinced you that you could claim it and not actually go get it. You wouldn't have to actually go get it. I'm telling you, stop claiming it. Go have it for real so that you can employ it in the earth. That's what I'm asking. We've had enough of the claim time. It's time for the works to begin. Don't you think? We're going to go into the book of Revelation, Revelation 12. He being with child cried out this Revelation 12 too. Travailing in birth and pain to be delivered. We know that's Christ. We know that is those are. What happened, you guys remember, Herod and Rome did things, trying to stop the birth of Christ. She pained to be delivered in disarray, uh, things going haywire and everything else. And listen to what it says. And there appeared another wonder in heaven, and behold, a great red dragon having seven heads and ten horns and seven crowns upon his heads. That's a complete draconian system. And his tail drew a third part of the stars of heaven, those the angels, and did cast them to the earth. Where did he cast them? To the earth. This is the story of, of the fall of the angels, the one-third that followed Lucifer and Lucifer himself. And the dragon stood before the woman which was first ready to be delivered to devour her child as soon as it was born. That was Satan. He was found in the very place Jesus was at, wasn't he? It was through men he was hunting Christ. 
He didn't do it himself, but through men he was hunting Christ. And she brought forth a man child, who was to rule all nations for the rod of iron, that's Christ. And her child was caught up unto God, and to a stone that was his crucifixion. This is a story. This is a summary of the whole story told in the heavens. But of course, only the wise men could see that. They could see that story too. That was the document I was told about. Two Jewish Israeli families have it. And it's a story about the wise men. They not only did they bring gifts, but they also left some parchment and instructions, right? So these guys knew the word of God by the stars. Isn't that something? They could discern the heavens, the stars. They knew the word of God by the stars. They also knew prophecy by the movement of those stars. Isn't that something? And the woman, and it says, and the woman fled into the wilderness where she hath a place prepared of God. That's when she had the baby. That they should feed her there a thousand two hundred and three score days. I don't know about you guys, but um, if the Bible is consistent, it's going to be consistent. And what do you know what it is? Very consistent. Extremely consistent. And there was a war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon fought, and his angels stopped and prevailed not. Neither was there a place found anymore in heaven. There was no place found anymore in heaven with him. Now, wait a minute. When did this story start? According to Revelation 12, the woman fled into the wilderness where she had a place prepared for her to have the baby. Right? Uh, not to have the baby. A place prepared for her where a event, a few events took place right before the disbursement. Now, you guys remember that the God's people, how they were dispersed, right? Right after Jesus ascended to the right hand of the Father. You remember what took place shortly thereafter. But do you know the stories? The same way we write news today, we can't help but to print everything that happens that we can see. So did they. They had scribes. That's what they did. They would document these things. And as it turns out, some things were happening back then. Rome was hunting for the Jews. The war started. That's when Constantine and all these guys eventually came on the scene. And things were changing and started. There was a war. Listen to me. There was a great war. Now this, I don't want this to upset anybody. But there were fake signs in the heavens all over the place. There were telltale signs of this war in the heavens also and within the hearts of men. There were great wars over faith and placement. Great wars over the gospel. Do you hear me? Great wars over the gospel. Great wars over the gospel. There was an element in the earth that would fight against anybody who would carry the name of Jesus. And they were to be killed on the spot. It eventually worked its way up to some folks who tried to sow an evil seed and dupe the world. But they didn't dupe God's people. And if you take notice, God's people, now America, the people, not America, the country, but the people in America at the time that tried to control academia and history. They wrote some things that are not quite as they should be. They left out a whole bunch. Let me give you an example of that. There, there are some documents on how the Bible almost never made it to America, how they fought it. All of you guys that are Catholic, you may be Catholic. This is the old Catholic church, not the new one, but the old Catholic church. That was full of devils. It really was. How do I know this? Now, that's not an insult. I'm telling you something. Because they pursued anybody who did not believe the Bible their way, and they sought to kill him. They would also, after they killed them, put him in graves and then come back and curse the grave. The apology letters are in the edict at the Vatican. Just so you know that's in there. You should know the history. You're not, you weren't back there, and you pursue Christ. But there were a lot of things that happened back then they did, they, people just don't know about. And they should. And it's printed, and it's free, and people can get a hold of it, but they won't touch it, and they don't want to look at it. Why? Let me tell you something, guys. I don't want you to get sick behind this comment. Let me tell you something. You are children of the living God. You should be first patriots of the kingdom of God, not the kingdoms of men. Do you hear me? You can do the kingdoms of men no good if you're not a patriot for the kingdom of God. People have that backward. They'll do the bidding of their country first against the kingdom of God. You cannot do both. You're going to have to make some hard choices. You cannot do both. You cannot. It sounds good. If people who are political, they like that term patriotic for the country over everything else. No. Patriotic for the kingdom of God. For the established word of Jesus Christ, which is the gospel. Not holding up the Old Testament and the law. Don't do that again. No, we're talking about the gospel of Jesus Christ. And what he established. You have to make some hard choices. And they will not like you for your choices. Just telling you that now, they won't. Back then, that same problem arose. 
And back then they wanted people to bow down to the government in the face of that government or they would kill them. It was illegal for anybody to have their own interpretation of anything. It was illegal for anybody to believe any differently than the ruling head back then. Now, if there was a war in heaven, you better believe it was within men on the earth. You better believe that. But the war in heaven was also seen. It became so commonplace. But they omit things from history and the teachings and their controlled educational system. We all know that. But it's of no consequence because Christ is the truth. There were things seen back then. 70 AD, on the day of 70 AD, there were things seen and reported back then. Shields, flying shields, even back then, with the lights on the bottom and all that good stuff. Even back then, there were cigar-shaped craft seen, even back then. So that's not some new concept. There were triangles seen back then, with three lights on them, one red in the middle. Back then, back then, these lights were seen. And some of the older, older, older paintings, the triangles are even documented. Back then, don't fall for the okey-doke. They were seen back then. So the angels who followed Satan were cast to the earth. They had already been at work. They were doing things and fighting, fighting, whatever they could fight. It says this, and the great dragon was cast down, the old serpent called the devil, and Satan was deceived with the whole world. He was cast out into the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. Where was he cast out to? The earth. When was he cast out to the earth? It didn't say he was just cast out of heaven. No, it didn't say he fell like lightning. Out of the heavens somewhere, and it says he was cast into the earth and his angels with him because he lost that fight. When Jesus said it was finished, he meant that it was finished. There's no placement for Satan up there anymore. Do you know that? This isn't Job's season. Satan was found and could be found roaming the throne of God, accusing all of us and everybody else during the time of Job. It's not like that anymore. He has no placement there. Why? You cannot accuse anybody. No, 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 let me explain it this way. Let's say I'm a judge. And sitting beside me is an advocate that will excuse anything from anybody who, or anybody he wants who comes to my face. Let's say we have a prosecuting attorney. Now, what can that prosecuting attorney ever say to me if everybody who comes has an advocate sitting right beside me? Can the prosecuting attorney say anything? No. Why? That means everybody is not guilty. So he can't accuse, can he? No, he cannot. Well, who's he? how could a person be found guilty? By the advocate. If they're rejected by the advocate, they're automatically guilty. But if the advocate speaks their name, they're innocent, no matter what. The prosecuting attorney has no job. He need not bring forth evidence. Because now the word, yea or nay, is in the mouth of the advocate that sits beside me. The prosecuting attorney has no job. He cannot accuse anybody. Because the advocate sits right beside me, standing ready to do what he does. I will never listen to the prosecuting attorney again. He has no placement in the court. He's got to go. Now, if a person is guilty, they're only going to be guilty by the advocate. No need for a prosecuting attorney. Satan can no longer accuse because the father is not going to hear him because of Jesus. Jesus died for all mankind. So even right now, Satan cannot accuse anybody. God will not hear him. There's no place found in heaven for him anymore. Do you see? Do you guys see that now? So listen, the great dragon was cast out. That old serpent called the devil and Satan was deceived the whole world. He was cast out into the earth and his angels were cast out with him. So where are they at? They're right here on earth. That's why the accusing voice is within humanity. Starting to see Remember when Satan didn't accuse Job through humanity, Satan accused Job directly. You're accused through hum humanity, not directly. The other words, because Satan is right here, and he has always been the accuser, and he always will be. That's why you should never accuse. Don't work for him. He is unemployed. Do you guys see that? He's unemployed. He has no job, no placement in the high court. So he just aggravates and stirs up stuff down here, hoping he can get somebody to believe a lie that they are condemned. He's trying to get anybody and everybody to believe that, to give up on themselves and begin to do horrible things. His only power now is to cause you to corrupt yourselves. And every time you enter into a sinful thing, that means it is disgust before you enter into it. Ding, ding, you hear that? That was my bell, my bell of recognition. Now go back in your memory. Before you commit a sin, do you not have a discussion about it? Is there something speaking to you? And who do you think that is? who just randomly comes up with some flesh desire. 
And if you start thinking about it, they amplify that desire until you act on it. Then after you act on it, you feel like you lost your placement with the living God. Like you're starting back at square one again. Who do you think did that? Now you know. Somebody said, Mike, why were they sent to hell, not earth? Nobody sent them to hell. They were sent to earth, not hell. They were cast out into the earth, not hell. When those, when Jesus walked upon, now listen, I hate to break tradition, but when Jesus walked upon those demons, what were they afraid of? They spoke what they were afraid of. What were they afraid of? They said, have you come to do something before the time? What did they say? Come on, somebody. What did they say? Let me tell you, there's a difference between man's word and God's word. All authority over the demonic realm right now in the earth is in Christ. And Christ did not send them to hell. He did not. And they were frightened to go to hell. They were frightened to go. Let me paraphrase. Have you come to do what you have to do to us before the time? Because they knew he was the warden. They knew he was the warden. They're not in hell. They're all over the place. Hell is enlarging itself because hell is reserved. It enlarges itself because the list of those going to hell is getting bigger. Those who were never meant to go there in the first place. They were frightened and terrified to be sent to that place. Jesus already cleared everything up. And we're going to see that in Revelation again. There's only one who has authority to send a demon into hell itself. In order to send something to hell, you have to have some serious authority. But that's not what Jesus did. You even have those in the bottomless pit who are going to be coming out of the pit. And they will eventually all go to the same place. I mean, says, Mike, when you leave this earth, you don't come back, right? That's right. See, I'm, listen, folks, I'm telling you, there's a hybrid gospel in the earth. And if you're not careful, if you like things that sound smart and they sound like they, they fit puzzle pieces, let me explain something to you. The Word of God is written in the Word of God that the Word of God must be discerned spiritually. So what happens if, if the average person can figure out the Bible? The average person is using their carnal mind, their natural mind. Carnal is natural, the natural mind. If the natural mind can figure the Bible out, how can it be holy? Because they figured, it, figured that out absent the Holy Spirit. How can it be holy? It's not holy if the carnal mind can figure that out. And so what somebody is doing, what some force is doing, is altering the Bible so that it sounds better. They're doing this by way of theories. Don't live your life by theories. Live your life by truth. Those were the fallen angels, my friend. You guys do know there are two sets of angels. The first set that fell, the 200 on Mount Hermon, who were the chiefs of ten. They're reserved in everlasting chains. Those are the ones that are in hell, not the one-third. If you don't know the story about the Nephilim, you'll be lost in the sauce. You're missing that gap. That's all. Those angels that made it with women, the 200 that had that pact on Mount Hermon, they are the ones reserved in everlasting chains. Jude, read the book of Jude. Those are the only ones. The other one-third is not in hell. Only the first set are in hell, the ones that fell on Mount Hermon. And why are they in hell and the other ones are not? Because if you take note, the other ones don't do anything directly to humanity. The one-third are the ones who did the unspeakable. And they did something directly against humanity in the physical realm. Any angel who does that will never run around spiritually. They have to be bound. A lot of people don't know that. That's why they have an apology letter concerning the book of Enoch. They lied about the first copy. They lied about the multiple copies. They're, they're, they're just lying about it. The lie is so deeply embedded to it, I, I don't argue about it. I just let people believe their own truth regarding that. But it certainly is a blessing. No, they will, they're bound, they're bound forever. They'll come out from where they're chained in hell to be thrown into the lake of fire. They will never be free. Those 200 that are bound. But keep in mind, those 200 that are bound are only 200. You have one third of the angels that fell. You have quite a few in operations right now. Right now they're in operation. Why do you think the earth is the way it is? When Satan is bound a thousand years, the dragon is going to be bound. No fallen angels, no bad angels, no nothing is going to be on the earth. And all of a sudden you have a thousand years of peace. Because the influence of those negative beings are not in the earth. And the Bible says it's not within a man to take a step of himself. That means you're being influenced for everything you do. Whether good or bad, you're being influenced by something. So that when you act on these thoughts of sin, and sin becomes, has its fullness, its manifestation through you. Death is a result of that. But you're acting on the word from these negative entities. Let me give you another point too. We don't know how many angels God actually made in the first place. Two-thirds could be a number so huge. It's too frightening to mention. How about that? That means the 200 that fell on Mount Hermon, and they were chiefs of 10, which means the number is actually probably around 200,000. That's a very tiny fraction of those who fell. They're bound in everlasting chains until the day of judgment. They will not go free. 
I'm going to say all said and done, hell is going to be thrown into the lake of fire. So there we are with that. So they're in the earth with the devil. Now, why would God not just put the devil in hell? As you see, listen, 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 folks. There are specific books that were written back in the 1600s, I believe, and back with Plato's time, which gave people this idea that somehow things were going in and out of hell. I want to remind you of something. The person who proposed that concept had a pagan mindset. The same person hated the idea of one God ruling all things. So then a lot of people are acting on this type of information that comes from pagans who believed in the worship of things that we wouldn't dare worship. So you got to be careful with that. Listen, a truth will all have a consensus. All of us, we have the truth in us. Collectively, do you hear me? Collectively. Collectively, we have the truth in us. So what that means is this. When somebody speaks an absolute truth, all of us are going to know it's the truth. Despite what you've heard, it's going to ring true internally inside of you. If we ever get to the point where we start confirming that what we don't have within us and what we do have within us, you're going to find a lot change. The men of standard, we do that all the time. Because we, listen, we read, all of us have read quite a few things and we've thrown half of it out. Because it does not resonate within us. But there are certain things that we thought possibly somebody made up and we would read certain things and it would resonate within all of us. Within every single last one of us. Can you imagine that? I'm telling you, that's how we know. We will physically, we got sticky pads all over the place, right? And we, my chair is a little, no, little flat notebook, sticky pads are in it. And every time we have certain ideas, we'll say, okay, we got to see what's what on this one. One means you agree, zero means you don't agree. If we get something with a bunch of ones back, it confirms deeply within us. Now, we're not asking, do we believe it? No, we're not, we're not asking that. There's something inside of us that will confirm a truth. It is beyond belief. It will confirm the truth. It's a knowing of something. It's like if somebody says, okay, a giraffe has a long neck. Right, okay, we, okay, yes. But suppose somebody came up and said, well, you know, a pig has a very long neck. Eh, something's wrong with that, right? You can't pull anything from within on that one. Even a baby who has never been taught about animals. And if you don't believe me, look at a child who's just learning to speak. And say, does a pig have a long neck? And they're going to look at you with strange eyes. Or point to an animal they've never seen before and call it the wrong name. And they're going to look at you like there's something wrong with you. It's the truth internally in us. I mean, it's internal. That's why kids know when you're lying. Husband, that's why your wives know exactly where you've been. Y'all went to the hardware store. Let me see your receipts. That's what she'll say. Why do why you want those? <laughs> right? Because there's a confirmation within us. Now, women have that with flesh. Gentlemen, you have that with flesh and spirit. Women, you have that with flesh, which is very important. Do you know why? You have to discern the cry of a child. You cannot do that if you could not discern all things of flesh. Never use that to your advantage and someone's disadvantage. Don't do that or you'll be driven insane. You'll go cuckoo. Don't do that. Use that for holy reasons. You can also hear spirits. That's why you should never speak your mind. Because there are too many things speaking to you about everything you see. You didn't even tell your husband that something is speaking to you. That you have an idea about everything. He didn't know that. Because it's an unwritten rule that women are not to say that. I'm just giving out all the secrets here. Let me stop. Anyway, use it for good things. That's why Eve could hear Satan. That's why Adam did not. Now you know. Ladies, God will never send a messenger to accuse anybody. Now you know, if something speaks to you to get the goods on somebody else, that is none of your father. Your father will never do that. All the dirt we have done in life, he has not disclosed to everybody. He does not do that. So never use what you're learning to defame anybody, to accuse anybody. Don't become an accuser because you'll make yourself a siren. Gentlemen, a lot of women do that because you're not listening to them. And they go find someone who will. A woman will always find someone who will listen to them. Gentlemen, please take that note down. If you would listen to them, they would not talk to everybody else so much. Problem solved. Back to Revelation. Okay. Listen, I heard a loud voice saying, In heaven now has come salvation and strength in the kingdom of a God and the power of his Christ. For the accuser of our brethren is cast down, which accused them before our God day and night. Oops. He's cast down. He's done. Why? Why is he done? Why is he finished? Because now has come salvation and strength in the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ. 
because the Lord went to sit at the right hand of the Father. The accuser is done. He has no position there. Listen, therefore rejoice ye heavens and ye that dwell in them. Woe unto the inhabitants of the earth and of the sea, for the devil has come down unto you having great wrath, because he knoweth that he hath but a short time. When Jesus came, that's when Satan knew his time was short. Folks, it's only been a couple of weeks in the scale of time since Christ went to go sit at the right hand of the Father. We're not going to have a third week. I just want you to know that. Satan knows exactly where he is. And so what has he been doing? He needs a masterful plan. He's been doing something. And I want to show you what he's been doing, which is the purpose of tonight. Because you guys know the title of tonight? The title of tonight, and I, I don't know how I did this, but I'm actually staying on focus, on topic. But the title of the, the title of tonight is the alteration of everything we know. Let me finish this, though. Listen. Therefore rejoice ye heavens and ye that dwell in them. Woe unto the inhabitants of the earth and of the sea, for the devil has come down unto you, having great wrath, because he knoweth that he hath but a short time. And when the dragon saw that he was cast unto the earth, he persecuted the woman which brought forth the man-child. This is the persecution of the woman who is a woman who gave birth to the man-child, the lion of the tribe of Judah. And it says this, And the woman were given two wings of a great eagle, and she might fly into the wilderness, into her place where she is nourished for a time, time, and half times, from the face of the serpent. And the serpent cast out of his mouth water as a flood after the woman. And it might cause her to be carried away of the flood. What happened when Israel was disbanded and the power of the holy people was distributed all over the place? They were hunted. How were they hunted? Now you know where anti-Semitism comes from. Now you know where the hatred comes from. That's an unnatural hatred. Haven't you noticed that people have no specific reason for hating the Jews, but they have every reason for hating the Jews? That's why you know it's not specific. If somebody said, well, you know, I don't like that person because they don't believe in so-and-so, and it was just that one thing, that's legit. When you don't like somebody for everything, that's satanic. That is nothing more than the spirit of accusation within a person, bringing up every single reason to dislike someone. Do you hear me? That's what accusation is. Accusation will justify of itself everything to accuse. But the woman, she was protected. Her disbursement was her taking flight. The dragon cast out of his mouth what? A flood. He cast out of his mouth water as a flood after the woman. Now listen, in Revelation, what does water represent? Water represents something in Revelation consistently. The beast comes out of the water. What does that represent? The many peoples tongues and nations of the earth so the people of the earth and the dragon and the serpent cast out of his mouth water everybody and anybody as a flood listen water as a flood here's here's the giveaway why would it be written he cast out of his mouth water as a flood what else are you going to cast water out of your mouth for for what flood is the only fitting thing there that lets you know something people of the earth people of america People of Saudi Arabia, people of every country on the face of the earth. The flood now is a multitude of people in their situations, tons of situations. Be carried away, to be occupied, to be wrapped up, right? To have a lost identity. And the earth helped the woman, and the earth opened her mouth and swallowed up the flood which the dragon cast out of his mouth. This word earth is very important here. It swallowed up the flood. How do you swallow up something without killing it? How could the earth swallow up anything without killing it? I'm telling you this because that's what was given to me. How do you do that? You ready? You occupy it. Give it something to do. The earth has swallowed all, a great many people, by doing what? Occupying them so much, they've lost their focus on what they were doing in the first place. And what, is the, what are the people of the earth doing right now? They're so busy with toys and trinkets and tinkets because the earth is yielding up minerals. Oh, my goodness. The industrial age. The earth. All that stuff came from the earth. Everything that keeps humanity occupied. Why is it always coming from the dirt? Think about it. It's always coming from the dirt. And it keeps people occupied enough that they do not spend all that attention. You got it. You're starting to see it. Okay, that was given to me. So now I give it to you. Now you know. And when I say it was given to me, I mean spiritually. And I have to go with what the Lord has given me. So when I say my views are a bit different from everybody else's, I have to be truthful to what the Lord has shown me. I am nosy, and I'm going to ask the Lord in a heartbeat, what does this mean? What is that? And when you know it, the Lord speaks to me in dreams a lot. He does. Dreams and visions, whatever you want to call them. But then he'll show me something. You know how when the Lord shows you something, you don't wake up and stretch, go, ah, what a good sleep. That's not what you do. You wake up confused, 
emotionally disturbed, right? It's all messed up. Now, so when you wake, when I wake up from one of those, it forces me to think about it, and then I'll instantly remember. Wait a minute, I did ask the Lord for this, and, and there it is. And then I'll say, Lord, is that what you really gave me? And guess what happens? The very next time I go to sleep, does exact same thing without alteration. So there you are. He does that a lot with me. Listen, find out how the Lord speaks to you. He speaks to us differently. He does. Not everybody is going to get a dream. He may speak to you through your noticing certain things that everybody else cannot. He can get your attention. You may notice a stop sign. Nobody else will. And you'll say, that's a stop sign. It looks different, but you don't say it out loud. Then you're driving down the street. Somebody's looking at you with a yellow shirt. You may say, they may catch your attention pushing a cart. But that makes sense to you, but nobody else. That's the Lord's language to us all. But listen, pray about it. That's why you pray about it. You pray about it, and then you the, the Lord will give you an answer, but then you try the Spirit by the Spirit, right? Just because you get something back that looks like an answer, do not buy that. You try the Spirit by the Spirit. That's what you do. Always do that. Christ will often be connected, and the story of Christ connected with certain things come back to you. The Lord will not hesitate to give that to you. I'm telling you, the Lord is real here, folks. He, he's absolutely real. But see, the problem is, we don't often engage him like he's real. We engage him like he's this mythical character of a quadrillion miles away that we may never hear from. And so we smile like we got an answer anyway. Don't do that. Get the real thing. Or don't smile. How about that? Don't settle for substitutes. Get the real thing with your father. Because he's certainly not going to substitute out for you. You're either redeemed or not. And it's not demanding anything of your father is that you'll accept no substitute for your father's truth. There you go. Because Satan is, he's a slick willy. I don't care if Satan hears my prayers. I don't, I don't know what the big deal is. He can't touch anything in my prayers anyway. And the Lord said, try the spirit by the spirit. I don't get caught up on that stuff. You know, people say, you know, can you stop Satan from hearing this? And who cares? He can't do anything. All he can do is influence you to corrupt yourselves. You know what the Lord told us? A man is drawn away and tempted of his own lust. If none of you want your hand burned off, nobody can tempt you to touch a stove that's been on high for one hour, can they? Could somebody come to your house and say, hey, that stove's been on an hour. You see, it's red hot. Put your hand on it. Nobody can make you do that. You look at that person and say, uh, get out of my house. You're not going to put your hand on that stove. Why? Because it's not in you to do it. Satan can only draw you by what's in you. So listen. When you find yourself being drawn towards iniquity, go to Christ to get it purged. Mention that thing. Expose it piece by piece. Open the whole closet door and say, Lord, look at these bones. I need you to see this so it's no longer hidden from you. Nobody else matters. You matter. And here it is. This is what I'm dealing with. And you take it to the Messiah. Why do we act like he's powerless? Why do we hide so much from Christ as though he is powerless and can't do anything about it? Why do we persist in doing that? Have you, have you guys noticed something? If we're not careful, our entire walk is going to be an illusion that we create ourselves. Because you have to admit we do act like the Messiah has no power, don't we? We pray to him, go look for the answer from the psychiatrist. What kind of stuff is that? And I'm not saying disregard your doctors, thank God for them. Doctors are in place to handle things you have no faith to ask your father to heal you about. So thank God for that. But what I'm saying is that we won't, we hide things from him. We'll go to him. Say you're not supposed to carry black rocks. So you have two black rocks, you put them in your pocket, your hands in your pocket. You say, Lord, thank you for cleaning me up. I'm so glad I don't have anything. Now you got your, you got those black rocks in your pocket. You know what it means? You're keeping them. The next guy walks up, he has three. He shows them to the Messiah and he says, I like these rocks and it's very difficult for me to get rid of them. So they start to heat up and they burn his hand and he drops them. But he realizes, I'm free. They burnt me, I'm free. The other guy still does not understand. And so he, he has them in his pocket. He hid them from the Lord. But listen, when you hide something from the Messiah who can already see it, you're actually concealing it. And in your concealment, you're doing something else. Anybody know what that is? You're keeping it. Anything you hide, you keep. If a kid hides bubblegum in their pocket, they're keeping it. They're not getting rid of it. Whatever you hide, you keep. Do you see that? Once you present that to the Most High, you're no longer in the process of keeping it. And I can assure you, the Lord goes to work. He will not work against your will because he gave you choices and he does nothing by force. So be forthcoming to the Messiah. 
Just be forthcoming. Have a real relationship with him. Because you're going to find out he's real. Somebody said hiding is lying. Yes, it is. But unfortunately, all of us continue to lie. We do. We don't want to get on that subject. But we all continue to lie. We're going to handle that subject one day. That's why I say concealment is keeping. When you conceal something, you're not willing to give it up. Anything we hide, we're not willing to give up. Right? God works. He will not go against your will. Do you know that? That's why we can do evil. We can do sinful things. He's not going against your will. But when you tell him you have a problem with something, you present him with something, right? And you have your palm, you, you have it open to him. And you're expressing to him that you're no longer. You no longer have a will to keep it, but it's just you don't know how to get rid of it. You're hooked on it. Then he goes to work. If you hide it, you're not willing to give it up. When you show it, you're willing to give it up. You just have no power to. See the difference? You see the difference? An addiction. Don't hide your addiction. Hold it out before the Messiah and tell the Lord the truth. Don't say, Lord, please help me to get off this stuff. Stop doing that. Say, Lord, I got a problem with this. I do not know what to do. Show them. Hold your bottle up to the air, whatever you have to do, but don't conceal it. And don't make up anything about it. You may ask, well, Mike, how do you know this? Because I tried every way but Sunday. Only the truth works with the Messiah. You're not going to make a deal with him. You're not going to sidestep. You're not going to slick willy the Messiah in any way. You have to present everything in truth and come to him in truth. You do that, you're going to be, you're going to be smiling with real joy. Hmm. Let's continue real quick. And the dragon was wroth with the woman. And listen, this is important. He was mad at the woman and went to make war with the remnant of her seed, which keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. Now, he was mad at the woman, wroth. He was angry at the woman and went to make war with the remnant of her seed, which keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. This is very important identification. The remnant of her seed is who? The remnant, the remaining elements of those born of the woman are who? Here's the important giveaway. They have the testimony of Jesus Christ. You, that's who you are. Who is he after? You, that's who you are. You, 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 and you. It also identifies something else. Only the remnant of her seed is on earth. That's you. That's who you are. Somebody asked the other day, I don't know why things always seem to come against the word of God in my life. Well, now you know. He's pursuing you, and his time is short. He's after you. Who is after you? And it's important that you know exactly who you are. So, can you see how Revelation 12... It's a small history lesson. It gives you the objective of the components which are about to be mentioned. It gives you the backstory of what he was, what the dragon was doing in the first place. It demonstrates and shows you exactly who the dragon is. Do you see that? Because when you go to 13, you begin to see something, right? You saw who he was in 12, right? He was the, he was the, it says, this was the dragon. A great red dragon with, with um, he, he had seven heads and ten horns and seven crowns upon his head. As soon as you get to 13, now I told you the dragon can do nothing directly, but he does everything through people. He's accusing through people now, but it was also working on something else. He knew he had a short time, so he started doing something. Guess what he did? Listen, Revelation 13, well, I'm not going to read the whole thing. I, I stood upon the sand of the sea and saw a beast rise out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns, and his horns ten crowns. Something that looks just like the beast. And upon his heads, the name of blasphemy. Something that looks just like the dragon. Stood upon the sand of the sea. This is not the dragon. This is the first beast Satan essentially through humanity influenced them to construct kingdoms that look just like his spiritual rule. That's why they look identical, except for the crowns, the number of crowns. Everything is the same. So Satan replicated his kingdom and they are now in the earth and have been in the earth. They have been in the earth. Every kingdom of Satan, Satan's kingdom, is the same all throughout the Word of God. It keeps people imprisoned. It forces new people to imprison the new people. It causes worship. It causes idols to be erected all over the place. It amplifies desires of flesh. This is what's built into the earth. Mammon is given a seat 
in the draconian system. Baal is given a seat in the draconian system. And men do worship it and love it so. And in his kingdom, they blaspheme God, his tabernacle. They blaspheme the Lord. They disregard his sacrifice. They do not have any spiritual truth. They operate like Babylon with the rule of law. Because remember, King Nebuchadnezzar was that head of gold, and every other kingdom that would come after him would be an inferior kingdom. But King Nebuchadnezzar was a standard. And he oper King Nebuchadnezzar operated by the rule of law, and he had everybody worship the rule of law, so that if the people died, the rule of law would stay. Therefore, people were bound by something created that now overpowered them. Just like now. See how simple that is. Now, when you get iniquitous people amending the rule of law, now you have an iniquitous system for real. We were warned about it, but nobody really paid attention. And there it is. And in that rule of law, there is a denouncement of Christ. Wickedness is made legal. In that rule of law, it instructs you how you may worship and how you may not worship. It's there. That's why in Revelation, later on in Revelation, it says at one time, now the kingdoms of this world have become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ. But ladies and gentlemen, that time has not happened yet. We're even given a hint that Israel, Israel itself, see there's a new Jerusalem. That's the holy city. The new Jerusalem comes down out of heaven, so it's not on earth. See? Satan did a very thorough job, but don't worry, Christ is coming back. If, if we could fix it, if God could work through us to fix it, he would have. No, he's coming back himself to do it. That lets you know we cannot fix it. It also lets you know this is part of our process. This kingdom of the beast, God has given room for this kingdom to be put on this earth. It's put here on purpose. Listen, when you pursue Christ, if you're not tried by anything, there's going to be no value in, in the relationship at all. What did the Father tell us all? He said, I change not. I am the same yesterday, today, and forevermore. If you know him by his word, then you know him. If you know that word in the beginning, you'll know the word in the middle, you'll know the word in the end. He changes not. He works the same way every single time. And this is his process. This is how he does things. In the book of Ezekiel, he got onto a group of people because they were criticizing evil. And God said what? I created the good and the evil. He was telling people they don't, under, they don't even know who he is. There would be no evil as God created the evil. He created the good and the evil. Why? Because people forgot about the process as to why they were here. And they got caught up in the elements of being here. This is your process. You're faced with evil and good. And you're choosing every day of your life. This process is for real. Your redemption is for real. The Messiah is real. And the process of the living God is real. And what you're soon to see will not deceive your eyes. For many will be too late. For those of you who believe in Christ right now, it is never too late. Because you've already said yes. You've just in a lot of areas of your life, you've not been empowered to walk in your own answer. That's going to change. Not by my words, not by anybody else's words, but by the word of God. That will change. That's already been declared. You will not remain the same. You will not. Folks, listen. I'm going to thank you guys for tonight's study. Hopefully you see that. Hopefully you also see these kingdoms of the beast in the earth for real. I really hope you see that. And begin to work toward understanding that you're not here to tear down every single kingdom. You're here to finish this process. You're here to represent the kingdom for others in this process. The Lord will assign you what you need to be assigned as you walk it. Just do it authentically and for real. And don't accept substitutes. Remember, you don't have to claim it. Go and get it.